Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at Salem, the United Church of Christ. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on life's journey, you are most certainly welcome here. I am Reverend Lawrence Richardson, and uh, to my right here, uh, we have our guest musician, Ms. Sophia Franklin. To my left, we have our uh, Minister of Innovation and Technology, JM. Uh, we have our liturgist, uh, uh, Sharon Alsepper, thank you so much for being our liturgist today. And to all of you, uh, my brothers, sisters, and kinfolk in Christ, I am just so delighted to be here with you this morning. Uh, before we begin worship, are there any announcements this morning? If so, I invite you to come to this microphone and to uh, make your announcement. I want to just, as Jeffrey's coming forward, say thank you to Maureen, uh, who led our crop walk last Sunday. Uh, we raised a good amount of money and had a good turnout. So thank you so much, Maureen, and thank you to all who attended as well. I have uh, two quick announcements. Uh, yesterday was the start of the uh, founders uh, or the farmer, farmers market, and so with Botsford Common, they are. Uh, or not Beaumont, I'm sorry, Beaumont, uh, they have set the walkabout. So yesterday was their walkabout to come to us yesterday. And we had about 20 plus people that showed up to hear a little history of the church and get some information about what we're doing. Oh, I'm on the wrong mic. No. <laughs> and then the other thing is we have our 2022 directories. They're in the back here and there are some also downstairs. So I'm just reminding everybody to get their 2022 directories. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. If you haven't had a chance, you should go out and look at the Memorial Garden. It's absolutely gorgeous right now, full of things that are blooming. The early ephemerals are all out. Um, in a couple weeks, we're going to have a plant sale, and I don't have my sign-up sheet here, but I will have it next week for you. Um, there's only a few more slots if you can help on the 28th with the plant sale. Mostly it's just helping people get things to their car, helping them find the plants they want, and hopefully we'll have a successful sale and have lots of more beautiful flowers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any more announcements? Well, if not, oh, we have one more on the back. I love it. I don't know if that microphone is working, but I'm going to use my teacher voice. Did everyone hear me? <laughs> I bet you can hear me a little better now. Oh, yeah. Uh, on the 4th of June, uh, we're going to be participating at a booth that's sponsored by our church at the Ferndale Pride. And if you uh, have some fun for a couple hours, see me. We could use your help. It's so much fun handing out all kinds of information and doing some really good things for the community at large. So thank you. Consider it. Thanks. Thank you all for your announcements this morning. Uh, Ferndale Pride, the plant sale. We have some uh, directories. And we have wonderful native plants springing up all around us. We have a lot going on at Salem. And thank you all so much. Now let us turn our hearts and our minds over into a spirit of worship.
The earth is warming, the bird song increases. The sweeter breezes brush our cheeks, and the earth holds both in its seeds and buds. Come, let us gather this morning with joyful noise. With, with warm hearts and with hopeful spirits, for we are one with the renewal of the earth, and blessed we have in the love of one another. Please stand for our opening hymn. This is number 108. Join me in the invocation, Mothering God, you created us and nurtured us into being. Like a hand broods over her nest, lead us in the grand and hidden places, to give us all who we are. As we gather to worship and praise, we offer the gift as representative of the best of who we are. We all sin and fall short of God's glory, and since our hearts and our sins are forgiven in Christ, let us also forgive one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. If you are joining us online, you are invited to leave a greeting or a sign of peace in the comments section, and if you are here in the sanctuary, you are invited to greet your neighbor with a sign of peace. And while masks are optional, there are still some people who are wearing masks, so we still invite you to practice physical distancing, especially for those who are wearing masks. And when we share our sign of peace, we share the peace of Christ, and for some people, it might mean a hug, and that might mean a handshake, and that's okay too. So just make sure you check with the person. So, the peace of Christ be with you. <laughs>
morning, but I'm not going to invite anyone to come up since we don't have any little, little ones, uh, but I want all of you to pretend that you're little, little ones. <laughs> Some people, Mother's Day is a really exciting time. So what I want us to do, so that we include everyone among us who are nurturers and life givers, I want us to think of someone. Um, and you can think of them, and if you feel comfortable, you can shout out their first name. And what I want you to think of is someone who is a nurturer, who's kind, who's generous with maybe their time or their talent, uh, maybe someone that gives you really good advice, or someone who's just there when you need them. And as you say their names, I'm gonna write their name on one of these hearts. I'll start by saying,
sure we could add a lot more names to that if we went on. And our folks on Zoom have some names that they've added as well. What I love is that each of us has someone that we can think of that loves us, nurtures, cares, listens, is present. And I am 100% guaranteed, without a doubt, so sure that each of you are also someone for whom that can be said. Your name also belongs on one of these hearts. So I just want to thank you and all of those who nurture and mother us, whether they know it or not. Let us pray together. Dear God, thank you for all of the mothers, the nurturers, the caregivers among us, for the lessons that they teach, for the love that they give, and for the legacy that they leave behind in us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Our first lesson is from Acts, <clears throat> chapter 9, 36 through 43. Peter is hastily summoned to the deathbed of the faithful Tabitha, who we know more commonly by her Greek name, Dorcas. Peter prays for her life to be restored, and it is. An important secondary point is that the gospel of Christ and the ministry of Peter and the early church has already moved beyond the Jewish community. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At the time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, who heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him with a request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put them all outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and <clears throat> many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. Here ends our first lesson. The second lesson is from Revelation chapter 7, 9 through 17. This passage is perhaps more familiar when used on the festival of all saints, but its theme is nonetheless relevant during the season of Easter. Assembled are the martyrs, the faithful who have survived terrible persecution, and they have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Among their eternal blessings are the privilege of standing before the throne of God, serving him continually in the temple and the absence of hunger, thirst, pain, and sorrow. The Lamb will be their shepherd and will guide them to the springs of the water of life. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes of people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm leaves in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood above, around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are there before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. 
and he will guide them to springs of water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please stand for our middle hymn. If there are singing over there, then it's number 128. Today's gospel reading comes from John chapter 10, verses 22 to 30. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you and you do not believe me. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me. But you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Here ends the reading of our word for the day. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the pondering of these holy and sacred words. Please pray with me. Holy One, I thank you for this day, for this opportunity to stand before your people. I ask that you move Lawrence out of the way and have me to be present to speak that which would come from your heart and your lips, dear God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you give us strength and you redeem us. Amen. Again, I'd like to say Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers and nurturers among us, and happy mothering to those who do the job as well. Thank you for the ways that you tirelessly give of yourself, the way that you care and love the lives entrusted to you. It's like we hear in our first lesson, Peter, the apostle, he restores the life of Tabitha, who is also called Dorcas. 
In our second lesson, we hear from John in the book of Revelation, and he paints a picture, a dynamic picture of what is to be inherited by those who remain faithful unto the end. Chiefest among these gifts is the ability to stand before the throne of God. Likewise, in our gospel text, Jesus says in verses 27 and 28, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Today, I would like to talk to you about spring cleaning for the soul. In the church I grew up in, there was a position called Mother of the Church. And for many years, my grandmother, Minnie Richardson, or Mother Richardson was her name, she was the chair of the Mother Board. And I can't tell you all of what that meant, but it was a position for seasoned women of the church, many of whom had children, but not all of them had children. The mothers of the church dressed in white and they sat on the front row and they were to act as wise counsel to the pastor and to the congregation. They prayed for the church every week before church started and they also created opportunities for intergenerational engagement. In other words, they were the nurturers of the congregation. Who are the nurturers among us in this congregation? Who are the people who offer wise counsel? Who prays for the church? Maybe not on Sundays, but on any particular day. Who makes sure that the wisdom and traditions of our faith are passed on to each generation? And while we don't have a position in this church called mother of the church, we do have many nurturers and mothers in this church. As Dr. Maya Angelou wrote in the book, Mom and Me and Mom, she says this, this is the role of the mother, why a mother is really important, not just because she feeds and also loves and also cuddles, but because in an interesting and maybe an eerie and otherworldly way, she stands in the gap. She stands between the unknown and the known. End quote. Mothering is an act of nature, nurture, and defiance. Mothering is a natural tendency and an instinct that some of us have, even if we haven't raised biological children. And the need to be mothered is inherent in the human experience. We all look for an example of someone to follow. I would also expand that to other species as well. What newly created life form doesn't flourish and thrive because of the mothering or the nurturing it receives? The act of mothering is also defiant because although we've created a society that promotes individualism, we know that no one thrives in isolation. The pandemic taught us that. Mothering or nurturing is what we all need, and in the absence of it, leaves us abrasive and impenetrable. I can think of countless examples of people who had a negative relationship with their mother, perhaps whose mothers weren't around, or whose mothers were very, very violent in their lives, and somehow they overcame. And it was because the mothering that they received through others, myself included. This brings to mind our scriptures for the day. Because mothers are those not only who nurture, but who are faithful. Those who nurture life, whether it be a child or a native plant. Or in Peter's case with Dorcas, the power of God, the creative life force of the universe is moving in and through you, through those who nurture life. When the power of God is alive in you, you can, we can do the possible and the impossible. And that's why it's so important to remain connected to those who nurture. Because they teach us how to live. They teach us how to grow. They teach us how to be. 
They show us what it means to be a community where all parts matter. Someone brings the water, someone brings the soil, someone brings the seed. Many people who work in church growth strategies focus their attention on attracting young families. There was a pastor who was hired by a congregation, and don't worry, this is a real story and it's not me. <laughs> but he was hired by a congregation to grow the church, and that he did. In the first two years, the church attracted over 100 new young families. On the outside, everything appeared to be going well. The programs expanded, they hired a professional Sunday school teacher and nursery staff. We have Mina, thank, thankfully. Uh, and the new pastor brought in a worship band and started offering evening services for the younger adults and teens of the church. The new pastor was proud of the work that this church was doing, but there was a group of elders in the church who were not so impressed. At one point, they called a special meeting so that they could tell the pastor what a lousy job he was doing. Their complaints? They said they hardly see him anymore. He spends too much time with those younger people. He doesn't serve the church the way the church should be served. And they feel like all he, do, all he does is cater to the young families. Eventually, the young pastor grew tired of the challenges he faced with the leaders of the church, and he offered his resignation. Within six months, the church had less people than they did before the pastor was hired. What could this church have done differently? Perhaps they could have started with Jesus' words in John 10 that we heard from Sharon. Jesus says that my father and I are one. When Jesus and I are one, or when your creator and you are one, we move differently than we do if we were by ourselves. So perhaps what this church in the story could have done differently is move with Jesus. Because when we move with Jesus, we can make space for new and different ideas, even if they are different from ideas that we might have. When it's just you or when it's just you and Jesus, how do you move? How do you live? How do you nurture? How do you treat people? Do you speak truth in love even if it hurts? Do you speak up for others even if your voice is shaking? Do you remain faithful to the end even in the face of persecution? Those who remain faithful are blessed. They are blessed not because it will be easy, but because in the end they will inherit the power and presence of God, and everything they touch will flourish. It's hard to imagine remaining faithful amid persecution or in the story of this lousy pastor, or perhaps sickness or challenges at home or at your job. This is when we look to our elders or the nurturers among us, those who have lived long enough to go through some things, because it's by their example that we know and learn how to live. We know that this isn't the first time something bad has happened in the world. This isn't the first time someone has been persecuted. This isn't the first time someone's been sick. This isn't the first time someone has had trouble at home or at work. It's by the elder's example that we can live and know that we can make it through. So who are the elders among us? Not the elders that, of course, will have the secret meeting and tell the pastor how much of a lousy job he's doing, but the elders among us who nurtured life and set the example and love like Jesus loved. Are you one of those elders? If so, what legacy are you leaving behind? And if you're not quite an elder, because maybe you don't feel like you have the experience or the seasoning, what lessons are you learning from the elders around you? What ways have you been nurtured by their existence? 
A church is a lot like a family. Edwin Freeman, who is the author of Generation to Generation, Family Process in Church and Synagogue, writes this, and I quote, each part of the family system is connected to or can have its own effect upon every other part. Each component, therefore, rather than having its own discrete identity or input, operates as part of a larger whole, end quote. The church is a family, a family system that can only operate as a whole. It invites all of our gifts and all of our shortcomings into this system of people called the church so that we can be interdependent for the glory of God. The longevity and health of a congregation is found in the ways that a church certainly embraces youth or young families, but it's also in the ways a church embraces the wisdom of her elders. Through the church, we are all mothered, we are all nurtured, we are all brought back to life. We are all like Dorcas. We are all given a chance at restoration. If you are going to lead or love in a church, or if the fortune of time is on your side and you become an elder by default of your age or by the example that you set for the rest of the congregation, what you are doing is life-giving to the church. Just by you being here is life-giving to the church. So as we prepare to close our worship, I want you to make sure that you thank an elder for being an example, for nurturing, for loving. If younger generations see the elders and leaders of the church growing spiritually because they are applying the lessons that they are learning and they are making a difference in their world around them simply by being the church, then the younger generation knows how to do the same thing. And then they are able to pass it on to the next generation. And likewise, if the younger generations see leaders or elders burnt out or anxious or miserable or unhappy or just going through the motions, this too is what they will inherit. So how do we receive mothering or nurturing in the context of a church? How do we embrace different generations and different perspectives of people? How do we lead by example? The word can be summed up by humility. And humility is a process of the spirit that develops through deep cultivation. And to cultivate a spirit of humility, got to do some spring cleaning of the soul. That means we must continuously scrutinize ourselves and our motivations. Christian discipleship or church membership invites us to be more like Jesus, not more like ourselves, more like him. And what did Jesus do to remain humble? He said, I and my father are one. Basically meaning I don't do anything without praying first, without checking in with my spirit. The church is also called to walk humbly with God. The church, as with any family or system, is susceptible to hardship and suffering, but if we embrace a spirit of humility, then together we will overcome any hardship and all suffering, because we are together. As you will notice, our native plants are springing up all around, and thanks to Beth, this is also the time that many of us go through our homes and closets to do some spring cleaning because why not? Let's get rid of some stuff, make space for some new stuff. Well, as we prepare to remain faithful and to become elders perhaps one day, if we aren't already, what in us needs to be purged or replaced or cleaned 
so that perhaps we can reflect the very presence and power of God. I would like to leave you with this quote from a very famous mother, Mother Teresa. Let no one come to you without leaving better and happier. Be the living expression of God's kindness. Kindness in your face. Kindness in your eyes. Kindness in your smile. May it be so. Let us pray together. Dear God, creator of all that is, all that was, and all that will ever be, we give you thanks, we give you praise for this day, for this opportunity at life again, for the ability to look past our own shortcomings, our own fears, our own hopes, our own joys, to just be present in this collective moment of prayer. We lift up before you all those who are suffering, who are in pain, who are alone or lonely, 
those who are devastated by acts of violence or terrorism, war, or destruction, for those who are hungry, those who are thirsty for your spirit, for those who mother and those who receive mothering, for those struggling with fertility, for those who have lost children, for those who have lost mothers, for those who never knew their mothers, for those who had difficult or challenging relationships with their mothers, or for those who had difficult or challenging relationships with their children. We lift up before you all our cares, our concerns, our joys, our hopes, our pains. Because we know that you hear us, God. We know that you are with us, that your spirit and that your presence gives us power. At this time, we lift up to you in our hearts all of those things that might be weighing on us questions, the hopes, the fears, the challenges, the joys, the praises, because we know that you are with us and we know that you hear our prayers. God, you are with us, and we know that you hear our prayers. And now we join our voices together saying the prayer that Jesus taught his friends, followers, and disciples. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for your prayers this morning. May we continue throughout the week in a spirit of prayerfulness. At this time, we present with joy our offerings of commitment and support for the world and for the work of Christ's church. Let us prepare Christ's table with offerings of our life and labor. At this time, I invite all who are online to give online by going to www.salemucc.us. And if you are here in the sanctuary, uh, you are invited to also give online or you can leave your offering in the rear of the sanctuary in the offering plate for all of your gifts, for all of those who give of time, talent, and resource. We are grateful for your gifts, for the work of this church, and for the wider United Church of Christ. And now that our slide is up, I will say, let us present with joy our offerings of commitment and support for the world and for the work of Christ's church. Let us prepare Christ's table with the offerings of our life and labor. As we offer our gifts, we stand and sing.
Dear God, for these gifts, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for all of those who will be recipients of the grace provided through these gifts. We give you thanks for all who had the ability to give, those who wish to give but did not have the means. God, we ask for your increase and blessing on their lives. And we ask for the gifts that we have received to be used for the nurturing of your church. We give you thanks and praise, and we dedicate these gifts to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You all may be seated. Jesus invites us all into beloved community, each of us, no matter who we are or where we are on life's journey. At Salem UCC, we practice what is called open communion, which means you don't have to be a member of this church or any church to participate in the sacrament of Holy Communion. If you wish to participate and you are online, I invite you, if you haven't already, to assemble your own communion elements of bread and wine, or you could have crackers and juice, wafers and water. And if you are here in the sanctuary after the words of institution, I will invite you forward down the center aisle where I will give you your communion elements, and then we will take them all together when you return back to your seats. Let us pray. Search our hearts, O oh God, as we prepare to receive your holy meal. Remove any hatred or sin or negative energy and forgive us for our shortcomings. Purify us so that in our sharing of this sacred meal, we receive the gift of your presence. Bless these elements of wine and bread that are your covenant and your life. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed by those who feared and killed him, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup of blessing, and he said, this represents my new covenant poured out in blood. Every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. At this time, I invite you, if you wish to participate in the sacrament of Holy Communion, to come down the center aisle and to receive the bread of life and the cup of liberation. All has been prepared. This table is set, has been blessed by Jesus Christ, our host. And now it is ready to be served. All is welcome.
as you uh, open your communion elements and begin to partake, uh, this is the bread of life, and this is the cup of liberation. We give thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table of plenty by granting us the power of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world with courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of your Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Now, friends, as we prepare to go forth, let us join together in our mission. Let us go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Honor the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the Lord, whose steadfast love is as constant as a mother's care, send us out to live and work for others. And may the blessing of God Almighty be with each of you and remain with you always. Amen. We stand for our closing hymn. Number one, two, five.
go in peace, everyone.